Okay, so we'll cut that one out. Okay, so Chris and Dr. <laughs> Gary, let me ask you guys this. <laughs> I like you said, I'll cut that one out. Yeah, I'll take that one out. All right, go February 25th, 2024, Sebastian Rogers is last seen by his mother, Katie Proudfoot, his stepfather, Chris Proudfoot, before going to bed. Although Chris Proudfoot claims he was at work over three hours away in Memphis, Tennessee. Katie Proudfoot said she heard a thud from her son's room around 10 p.m. that night, told him to go to sleep. On February 26th, 2024, Katie Proudfoot said she went to wake her son up, only to find he was not in his bed. After searching the house, she called her husband, Christopher Proudfoot. From there, they called the authorities. February 27, 2024, authorities changed the alert to an Amber Alert, which indicates investigators believe possible abduction could be involved and that the child is in imminent danger. February 29th, 2024, police drained a pond near Rogers' home but found nothing. Authorities said while there were multiple tips received from people looking through security. February 25th, 2024, Sebastian Rogers is last seen by his mother, Katie Proudfoot, his stepfather, Chris Proudfoot, before going to bed. Although Chris Proudfoot claims he was at work over three hours away in Memphis, Tennessee and said there was no specific evidence that led to the search. PM that night told him to go to sleep. On February 26, 2024, Katie Proudfoot said she went to wake her son up, only to find he was not in his bed. After searching the house, she called her husband, Christopher Proudfoot. From there, they called the authorities. February 27, 2024, authorities changed the alert to an Amber Alert, which indicates investigators believe possible abduction could be involved and that the child is in imminent danger. February 29, 2024, police drained a pond near Rogers' home but found nothing. Authorities said while there were multiple tips received from people looking through security footage, they could not confirm any sightings of the teen. And on March 7, 2024, Police searched a landfill in White Plains, Kentucky. Authorities called the search precaution, noting it was where trash from Rogers' neighborhood was taken and said there was no specific evidence that led to the search. We're live. Welcome to the Witness Box, everybody. I'm your host, Joshua Diaz, alongside my co-host, Dr. Gary Bricado and Chris McDonough. And... Uh, Chris McDonough of the interview room on YouTube. If you haven't checked it out, you should definitely do it. And Dr. Gary is a forensic psychologist and he has a wonderful book that is called the new evil. He co-authored it and uh, with Dr. Stone and you can get it on Amazon or uh, Barnes and Noble or any major bookstore near you. Uh, It's a big hit book. I'm delighted to say what's that. A big hit book, I'm delighted to say. I was really happy because I saw that uh, it was included on a list from short form uh, that gave it as one of the top 100 true crime books ever written. Oh, wow. And- I'm very proud of that. Uh, I was I was alongside people like John Douglas uh, and Burgess, uh, people like that. Uh, I was really, really proud of it. And there's been a lot of true crime books written. No surprise there. No, not at all. Well, I, I mean, it was a big deal. It, that I understand that uh, some, you know, prominent people judge those books for short form. And, you know, so I thought that was pretty cool. It absolutely it meant a lot to me. They use a textbook in some places. When did you find so that, that out? I, mean, I found it on the Internet that it was included in the. Oh, very cool. I think it's number 91 on the list. Top 100. Isn't that cool? That's absolutely. I mean, but like Chris said, it's really, I mean, it is, a, it's pretty detailed, man. You, you put a lot of, you and Dr. Stone put a lot of work into it. So I'm wait sure. till the new one and the new one I'm working on, I'm going to introduce five or six totally new theories. So I think people will. Do you have a name for it or no? I, yes. I'm going to, if it gets published with the title I have, I'm going to call it traveler in the darkness. Oh, that's interesting. But, but, um, but uh, I will say that uh, uh, the only 
tragedy of it is that Michael isn't here to see it. I think he would have been very proud of it. But uh, so, but I completely understand that, Chris. Tonight we're going to talk about. <laughs> tonight we're going to talk about an ongoing case out of Hendersonville, Tennessee, uh, and that is the mysterious disappearance of 15-year-old Sebastian Rogers went missing from his home uh, in Hendersonville somewhere between 10 p.m. and 6 a.m. February of this year. He was last seen at a at a roadhouse uh, restaurant. Basically from there, nobody has seen nor heard from him besides his mother who claims that, that she was at home with him at, I believe, 9 p.m. or 10 p.m. She tells him to go to bed. Uh, she hears what she describes as sort of a thud, tells him to go to, go, you know, knock off what you're doing and go to sleep. Uh, and then wakes up in the morning, 6 a.m. for school, and he's nowhere uh, to be found. No signs of forced entry, no sign, you know, no windows open, no garage open. Nothing. Um, now, you know, a lot of people have a lot of theories about the case, but nothing really tangible. Uh, law enforcement has, you know, mums the word either because they have nothing or they don't want to say what they have. You know, either is an option. Um, but, um, you know. At the, at the boy, just for the uninitiated that are listening, the boy was on the spectrum. He was. And, and the thing with that, too, is that he was just really recently diagnosed within like the last year or two. And um, but yes, he, he was on, he was on the spectrum. He, he was on medicine, uh, supposed to be on medicine. And it's you know, I think we're going on six months now of of him missing. And there has there's just been some. Uh, behavior or I wouldn't even say just behavior, but there's a cloud of suspicion around the case. There's, there was no, there's been no sign of him whatsoever. None, not a video, not a, a sighting, nothing. And wow. which is, you know, right. well, you're like Holmes famously said, when you've eliminated the impossible, whatever remains, no matter how improbable must be the truth. Sure. And I mean, I mean can't find any proof that somebody left their house. What does that leave? That somebody left with them. <laughs> they never left the house. Right, right. <laughs> you have to look inside the house, right? I mean, Chris, what you say from an investigative perspective, no trace whatsoever of leaving the house would lead you, obviously, to have to look in it. Uh, and uh, Chris is nodding, I think. Uh, 100%. Uh, yeah, and, um, you know, the audience that can't tell. But, but I think um, it, there's a couple of things I, I think, you know, as somebody that I think I'm going to take more of a, I want to take kind of a listening role in this case. I'm very interested and I love your thoughts when you two talk about this case. But I, I will say two things. One is I have extensively worked with people on the spectrum in my career. And, you know, there are, depending upon how severe the, you know, he, the person is in terms of placement along that spectrum, there can be things like, you know, rigidity of behavior where you don't really expect somebody to do pat to do things that are too out of pattern, right? Uh, you know, stereotyped interests, temper tantrums and, and, and um, you know, meltdowns that can be very difficult to manage. Uh, sensory experiences like being highly sensitive to noises, uh, you know, all kinds of things that can be very difficult from a parenting point of view that can be very difficult in the home. Uh, and um, if you have somebody who was sort of recently diagnosed, you then start wondering about somebody who might have been beginning to escalate or showing signs more because autism is a developmental condition that would go back all the way to earlier in life. But it gets diagnosed now that would imply something is intensifying or getting noticed for the first time uh, when somebody is leaving the home and, you know, interacting with other children or things like that. And they start seeming odd, you know, as they're getting older or something is making it obvious so that that's very important. I can't help but think that that change in status and how somebody might be interacting with the family could be something that in some vague way, I can't put my finger on figures into this story somehow. 
Um, and uh, the, the second thing that I think it's important to say is, um, I don't know what you guys are going to say, and Chris, I'm especially interested from an, an, a law, law enforcement perspective, but to me, it seems that you wind up with these kind of buckets in terms of possibilities here, and we have to weigh all of them agnostically, right? But the, bu the buckets seem to be like a lot of autistic children who go missing, he wandered out, right? And then you usually find the child very quickly. Uh, uh, Josh, you and I have talked about cases like this where an autistic child wanders off and then they're found, you know, um, they've fallen into the water, they've gotten lost in the forest, yep. they're cold, they're hungry, something happens to them, an animal gets to the whatever, some horrible thing. There are also cases, I think, in bucket two, where there's either an abduction from the home, but usually for sexual purposes, unfortunately, or the child has wandered out and then been taken by an offender who opportunistically does so. And the third possibility, which the Sherlockian dictum points us to, is that there's some internal thing uh, with a potentially, I mean, you know, and we can't really cast aspersions here, but I guess that if it was something internal, then we would have to suggest that maybe there was some cover, cover story to conceal that. Uh, is there anything other than those three possibilities that would be on the table here from uh, those yeah. communities, right? Yeah, no, and I think the most important piece to talk about yeah. is is the fact that those possibilities that you've just kind of related there right. with the exclusion of the, the house problem. Right. Majority of those children, if not all of them, at mm -hmm. some point are found. Yes, or very close to the home are found right. not not well, not no. not okay, because they can't get very far. Right. And no. if it's a water situation, they're found in the water. Mm -hmm. If it's a, you know, a walk away, they're typically found, you know, within a geographic regional, you know, environment. Uh -huh. And I mean, I think the biggest elephant in the living room on this one is this young man was on medication. And we have the investigators have to take that into consideration, uh, or quite frankly, they're not doing what is common sense. I mean, if you have, if you look at the big picture here, to have such a, a high level of, you know, experience, yeah, when guys like us, you know, that only work, you know, hundreds and hundreds of dead people, you know, and. I have walked my Jack Russell, though, and talked to him while doing it. However, you know, I always look forward to the expert opinion. Uh, that said, one, one of the things uh, that I think is obvious here from an investigative analysis aspect is if the father, the stepdad, or the biological dad, let's take him into consideration here for a moment. If you look at the big picture of the victim risk continuum, which I was talking about. You look at environment, situation, circumstance, low, medium, high. Okay. This has all the indications of a very low risk situation. Uh, evident of the fact that, you know, 10 at night to six in the morning. And it reminds me of when I consulted on the um, Elizabeth Smart case. Oh. Where the investigators were focusing outside of the house on Ricky and we kept telling them, you know, no, you need to keep focusing inside the house. Somebody somewhere has crossed paths with that residence. And of course, you know, later on the young sister wakes up one day and she had an epiphany and says, oh yeah, it was the handyman. Okay. That's who it was, who, who came in. And lo and behold, you know, Elizabeth is out there today, thank the Lord, you know, talking about her experiences and talking about the handyman. And you know that guy, Gary. I mean, he was, you know, oh, yeah. just, just not. So it was never, I have some of his writings here that uh, about nine or ten pages of what was apparently some kind of bizarre journal that he was keeping. I have here uh, that I was using at the time we wrote The New Evil. And um, I never did anything with it, but pretty fascinating read yeah uh, so it's very bizarre yeah yeah so if we take that as an you know just kind of a layover 
into the, you know, Sebastian Robert Rogers case, you know, what are the odds of, you know, somebody coming into the house, you know, stealth, somehow not leaving any form of evidence in any way, shape or form that we're aware of anyway, in the public arena and coming in and saying, Hey, you're coming with me, kid, you know, right. get him, out, get him out of the house. And he's been wandering around the United States, you know, with this coven of some sort, you know, we know that Elizabeth was taken, uh, obviously for sexual assault reasons. And that was his primary motivation. And so what would be the, the first question, just taking into account, not only the victim risk continuum, but what's the motivation here? What's the motivation of somebody, a stranger abduction coming in and taking a 15 year old autistic young man out of his house? Number one. Or, right. or off the street if he's seen wandering shoeless, you know. Right. And, we got to get him out of the house, right? We got to get him right. out of the house first. Right, right. One of the what would be the what would be the motive? Well, based on statistics, Chris and you and I both know from our respective fields that the number one uh, uh, best bet would be for sexual purposes. Okay, uh, so I mean, wouldn't you agree? Yeah, absolutely. So now you have to, now we have to ask ourselves. Okay, well, what are the circumstances in relationship to who's awake, who's hearing, who's hearing what? And you have mom saying, well, I heard a thug. Okay, well, what does that mean? What, 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 how do we make sense of that when a parent who's looking you know, to say that their child evaporated from their house and in the middle of the, you know, the conversation, she says, oh, yeah, around this time, I heard a thump or whatever it was. Josh, how did she describe it? His mother referred to the noise as a thud. So what does that mean? Uh, you know, as a just being open minded here there, I guess we can all interpret that as being a hundred different things. Yeah. Okay? But we also can interpret that into one thing. And that one thing is dangerous or something happened where the mother describes it to the world. Something happened, a thud. Okay. You know, what they don't have evidence of is what that means, the thud, what that thud meant. Was it criminal in nature? Was it, did he fall off a of bed? I mean, we could go down a whole list of a hundred different categories of where that word would fit into, but it's a descriptive word of an activity. And that is problematic in a criminal investigation. Well, here's another thing, though, that's problematic about the thud, Chris, is that in her first in her first interview with the news, uh, I believe it was the local I don't know, KTF five or something like that. What she said was that when she heard the thud, she didn't she didn't get up and go check on him. She just said to go to go, or knock off whatever he was doing, go to sleep. And then. I think in future, I don't think I actually know. I just don't know exactly which one that after there was an immense amount of criticism, uh, why wouldn't you get up when you heard a thud? You know, you have a, a, a child with special needs. She then changed it to that she did check on him. But the initial story is that she only said, uh, knock it off, go to sleep. So if she said then, she checked on him, what did she say? Yeah, well, she, she never specified. She never specified. That's, that's a red flag. I would imagine it, so. You see, I mean, if if somebody says, yeah, I, uh, I heard a gunshot, and I went to check on it, then the next question from an investigator is, and this is what we're not hearing, well, what did you see? Well, you know, blah, blah, blah. 
now you just kind of overlay that into, well, I heard a thud. Okay. All right. What did you do? Well, I went and I, I went and took a look. All right. What did you see? And there's a narrative behind that somewhere. It And that narrative, you know, we don't know what that is. But, you know, at some point, somebody, sounds like her, changed her story. All right? No problem. Summer, Summer, are you down there? Okay. I went down there. Okay, well, I don't remember if the door was open or locked. Okay. Yeah. You know? yeah. Like you said there, too, another thing is that when when she first found out that, you know, he was missing, uh, another another red flag would be that she, she called the stepfather, Chris Proudfoot, who was allegedly three and a half hours away at work in Memphis on a job site. And, and nobody knows if that's verified or not, but look, let's just take him. Let's just take him at his word, say that, you know, okay. But nobody ever called nine one one. They, they, they circumvented nine one one somehow and decided to call the local sheriff's department. Um, and you know, Candace as well wasn't the one to call nine one one. It was Dawn uh, from a, a from a different somewhere. He was in Sullivan County or something like that, and um, it was. Uh, but there's never just like in a lot of these stories, like you said, the door was open or wasn't open. There was a thud. There wasn't a thud. Nothing's ever nothing's ever straightforward. You know, there's never any like. Like, yeah, I called 911 immediately. The father, Seth Rogers, wasn't even notified by the mother. She didn't call the father who they split custody with. She didn't call the father to say, have you seen Sebastian anywhere? That's not what happened, which to me is a red flag as well. But I don't want to get too far ahead. But, um, yeah. No, those, those are solid points. And so she calls, who do they call? What time are the what time is the sheriff's department notified? Uh, I believe it was around six thirty in the morning. Okay, so thirty minutes. Something hypothetically, if yeah. she's if the reporter the report is, yeah, I went in and I looked to for him. He wasn't there at six a.m. Around six thirty. When does she call Chris? She says after after a few minutes of searching the house, uh, then she calls Chris, who then, I believe Chris is the one that calls uh, law enforcement, but it wasn't 911. And, you know, a lot he of people... He calls the non-emergency line. Called the non-emergency line. Correct. Which is recorded, by the way, so hopefully he knows that. I'm, I'm sh <laughs> Who knows what he knows, but... Oh, it's recorded. Yeah, no, I, I would agree. But, yeah, you would think that that would be a 911 kind of phone call. Well, yeah, well, or or if you're trying to avoid the recorded line, you know, maybe you're thinking if you're not the sharpest tool in the shed, you know, I'll just call the police department, not emergency line, and that's not recorded. Well, you know, here here's a here's a zinger for everybody. Every line in every police department is recorded. <laughs> yeah, okay. right. So whatever that conversation is, it's sitting there. Can you walk us through what you're thinking right now? I just want my baby to be okay. I don't know where he's at. He's going to walk through that door, and this street will be flooded again with family and relatives all waiting to hug him, love him. And Stepdad Chris says it's been an emotional roller coaster that all started Sunday night, February 25th. Pretty normal. He was playing in his room um, when I told him to go to bed. He did. <laughs> Um, he said, good night, Mom. I love you. Katie says she went to wake up Sebastian around 6 a.m. Monday for school, and he was gone. Within minutes, Katie says she was on the phone with Chris, who was working out of town, and they quickly called 911. And he's not a runner. He's never run away before. Um, I don't know why. I don't know why he walked out that door. I mean, he's a good kid.
Chris, from a law enforcement perspective, doesn't it strike you as odd that um, rather than saying something open-ended like, I don't know why he walked out that door or why somebody might have wanted to take him or hurt him, that the mom says here, I don't know why you walked out that door and volunteers that? Is that an odd thing in your perspective? Yes. It's a very, it's a sign of deception. She takes a deep breath. Uh. She exhales, closes her eyes, and then she just answers without even being asked the question about anything close to that. Why, why doesn't she say something to the effect of, well, I heard a thud. I thought that was weird. Right. Meaning the mom. Right. And, and yeah. so to answer your question, yes, absolutely. That's a, that's a red flag. Let's listen to that again. I don't know why. I don't know why he walked out that door. I mean, he's so as you said that it was just volunteered information. Nobody asked her, do you, what do you think happened? Um, she's, she's, she's saying that he walked out the door, uh, almost as a matter of fact. I mean, wouldn't you say, uh, Dr. Gary? Well, I mean, I just think it's interesting because I mean, I can't, you know, cast any aspersions here, but I think we would all agree that when you're completely unsure of what happened, it is odd to say in a kind of declarative way, I don't know why he did X as if you knew that. Because it, if you really thought that he had walked out the door, what are you doing sitting here? Run out and <laughs> go, go looking for him. I mean, it's just there's something about it that I find. Right. The delivery is, you know, talk, pause, breathe, close eyes. And then and then the answer is, I don't know why, why he walked out the door. Well, that wasn't the question. That, that, it's and then he looks over at her like confirmation, and at least at least in the video. I mean, obviously we're recording this, so folks can't see this, but they can go back and watch it. I mean, I, I'm taking notes here, going, okay, check. You know, Steve Johnson and I did a did a deal on this. Folks yeah. can go yeah. watch that. It was and terrific. We, yeah, we correct. break some of this down, um, but yeah, you're right. It's it's completely unsolicited, unsolicited information. Um, when the last time she hears it is he's in the house, here's a thud, and now all of a sudden she's got him at six o'clock in the morning or something, walking out that door. How does she know that? Where did that come from? Last time she heard anything was she was she heard the thud. Right. And, and I, I don't remember. I certainly watched the show you did, and I thought it was terrific. But I don't remember if that same point was raised there, but I bet it was. I'm sure you, you two picked it up also as peculiar. Yeah, I don't know. We'll have to go back and look at it yeah, together. I would be very surprised if not, I mean, because it really jumps out. And I'll link, and, I'll link those in the description as well, this interview and Steve and Chris's breakdown on the interview room. Right. Now, I know that someone is going to be listening who says, well, you can't really assume that that's the reason that that statement was made. It could be that the notion of thinking about somebody abducting the child is so unthinkable, is so horrifying, so shocking that someone might be inclined to just say, I don't know why you walked out the door as a kind of denial of that possibility. That's plausible, I suppose. Um, but Chris, I think we need to take a moment and uh, and really discuss why the abduction possibility is just as improbable as the walking out the door. Well, be, for a couple of things, one, right. um, let's use the medication as a, a perfect, as an example. I'll go back to that concept. First of all, if the young man's on prescribed medication, then, you know, number one, we're five months into this. And that medication is hasn't been on board with this young person. And so now we have to jump forward and say, okay, let's let's hypothesize that the biological fathers, you know, he's got some kind of scheme 
where he's going to, you know, abduct his own child, um, somehow get himself on video at work, you know, for 12 hours. So that means he has to have somebody else do it. And then now that he has this kid, i.e. he wants to keep him away from mom here because they're going through, you know, whatever custody battles or whatever the problem is. Well, now he has to stash the kid in a house somewhere, uh, wait till he's, you know, three years down the line till he's 18, okay? not give him his medication because hopefully the authorities have been tracking that and discovering that no those meds have not been on board and they have not been refilled and know that child is not getting those prescriptions. And then at the conclusion of three years, when Sebastian walks out at 18 years old and says, Hey, I'm here, I'm back. Then the father, the biological father is at risk of going to prison. So the bigger question, so the first question you have to ask yourself is, is that probable? Mm, I don't know. In my book, uh, it's really not rocket science. The answer is, for me, no. Take it off the plate. Let's focus back at the house. So now the second problem that we are discussing here is what are they saying in the house? Okay. What is the stepdad saying? What is the biological mother saying? But then... You have to say to yourself, okay, well, we don't have evidence, quote, from the sheriff of a criminal of criminal activity. No problem. I've seen hundreds of cases where there's been no evidence of criminal activity. It doesn't mean criminal activity hasn't occurred. Okay? You just have to, as she said, do good old-fashioned police work, i.e. gumshoe, and you start talking and interviewing. You know who I would start with? I'd start with the other four wives at length of the stepdad and i would learn his patterns of behavior around children around women around you know who came around him to pull him out uh, of the dungeon when he went through four previous other divorces as investigator as an investigator i would start pulling all that divorce paperwork and and interviewing all the ex-wives not even that not only that i'd start looking up his social profiles how did he meet these women where did they meet what were their dates like what did they talk about how how aggressive or non-aggressive was he and then i would look at patterns of behavior if uh, going through four divorces, well, who stood by him during those four divorces? Was it his family? Was it his mom? And if it's his mom, that's in, you know, you know that, Gary, I mean, from a behavioral analysis aspect, okay? if mommy's always cleaning up his junk and his destruction, i.e., when he lights a fire, and runs from it and she comes and stomps it out are you've got to look at now those secondary circles within the inner circle is is there something going on between the family as a whole and that's where you shift and you say okay well are they hiding him meaning the mom the biological mother from the step from the biological dad is that a possibility What's going on there? And if so, how could that have unfolded? And and if if the again, the simple process in that is where's where are they getting the medications for the boy? If they're hiding him out somewhere. Okay. Because now if you go to a stranger, i.e., he walked out of the house and he ran into a stranger, well, the stranger doesn't know he needs medication. He's not going to care, and that that exam or that challenge of life becomes less and less. And well, go ahead. Well, whatever there's now, now remember this is all hypothesis, right? Because 
we're saying that if we feel that the wandering out of the house and the abduction hypotheses don't seem to have much support, um, and then we're thinking about something inside the house, then we start thinking, you know, when you're dealing with something like a domestic issue, let's say perhaps even a domestic homicide, right? Well, first of all, you know that I that the, this term that I kind of co that I coined, elimination murder, right? Is the first thing I always think of in a domestic situation. I say, is there someone who stood to gain by somebody being disappeared? Did somebody gain financially? Was the person an impediment to a romance or a new relationship? Were they, um, you know, uh, uh, a burden uh, in some way, etc.? And if you take the elimination thing off the table, what's left? Well, emotion, sheer emotion that erupts, right? And if it's sheer emotion that erupts, well, then, Chris, in the kind of background check you're talking about, I think you're 100 percent right in that what you'd be looking for would be signs of explosive rage. Exactly. Somebody who in an explosive rage does something to someone and then other people who are scared of them help cover that up or whatever. I think that's what you're suggesting needs to be flushed out. Right. And and if you that's a hypothesis and I assume it is being pushed out if because I can't imagine law enforcement doesn't think about it the way that we are. Well, yeah, no, I I would I would assure you they're thinking this way. Right. right. About all possibilities. Right. 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 And, and regarding the, the abduction. See, this is the thing. I mean, Chris, you and I, <laughs> we we do a lot of work with a lot of people that would officially be called profilers right and we certainly are well aware of uh, a lot of the techniques that they use and you know and and um i think from a profiling perspective um you know there are really two wide categories of these kind of sex offenders that would take a kid right well the first would be the schmoozing psychopathic kind of in um savvy kind of offender who would groom a child over time they would get to know them they would insinuate themselves into the family they'd be the coach they'd be the priest they'd be the rabbi the imam you know what i mean that kind of figure the friend and then they attach themselves and over time develop a relationship and then go off with the with the child to defend but the other kind the kind that would just burst into a house at night and take a kid sleeping or something they have to be more socially inept more odd peculiar people you, you know what i'm saying chris i mean the kind of person that would be probably a local that opportunistically takes a kid like out of a mall when the mother's not looking or something or just snatches a kid in a car that's going by, you know and i feel like already you'd be looking at somebody who wouldn't do this only once who probably would be a repeat offender so the first thing you'd be thinking of is something like a weird local sex offender that would already be known to law enforcement if you were profiling the kind of person that would snatch a kid out of the house in the middle of the night, you know, that kind of thing. Right. And already, it's kind of hard to imagine why they'd be so stealthy and feline that they could do it without making any noise except possibly a little thud <clears throat> when without any trace. So we're saying a weird psychotic-like or bizarre person who also has this incredible cat burglar-like precision that takes this 15-year-old child out of the house without making much noise and without any trace of it and, with, and who doesn't have any local record, like this is their first time or something. I mean, in other words, <clears throat> when you start going through the likelihoods, it becomes more and more of a stretch. And I don't know if you would agree that from a sort of profiling perspective, it's a hard sell that that's what happened. What you say, and it's, a hard, it's a hard sell. First of all, you've got to control a 15-year-old autistic child. Who's going to be um, right. number one? Okay, you have allegedly ten at night to six in the morning to do it. You've got eight hours. Okay, within that eight hours, whatever it is, you somehow have to get into that house. And by the way, when you leave, you you don't forget to lock the doors. Okay, right. and, and secure the windows, and turn off the video. Make sure there's no video. Make sure there's no ring cameras. You know, yada yada. Make sure all this doesn't exist. And and he somehow, you know, let's let's put ourselves in the perpetrator's shoes. 
The guy goes in. He's got, first of all, he knows exactly where Sebastian is because he's going to go into his room and not accidentally go into the mother's room. And while he's in there, he either, A, wakes him up or Sebastian's waiting for him without his shoes. Right? And says, all right, you're coming with me because I met you online. Let's go. Okay. And, you know, we're going to go to Disneyland or Disney World or whatever. Okay. We're out of here. And now this individual gets him out of the house, okay, locks the door behind him. And then mom wakes up 6 a.m. and decides, well, it's time for school. Let's go check on Sebastian. So she walks in there and immediately goes into her head. Oh, he walked out the door. Does anybody think that sounds logical? No. And he would have to walk out of the house undetected, nobody noticing anything, middle of the night or whatever it is. Barefoot. Right, a real pro. Yeah, you know, it would take a lot to be undetected for this long, uh, running away, being a 15-year-old. Can somebody name another case? Anybody? The, the, last, the, the same last, question arose? Of yeah. Ridiculous Can story. anybody name an, uh, a national case where a child was taken out of the house outside of Polly Kloss, outside of Elizabeth Smart, can anybody name another case where the suspect came into the house totally undetected? And by the way, the polyclos case was solved. The, you know, Elizabeth Smart case was solved okay, because these guys were wrecking balls when they came into the house. And, you know, they left evidence, i.e. something or somebody saw something or they left something on the you know, when the polyclos situation, they left he left stuff on the window, the window frame. Right. But, oh, 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 the, the, I, the only case I can that comes to mind is the famous Edward Paisnell case, uh, the Beast of Jersey, who would take a ladder or whatever, climb up to a child. What year was window. that? Oh, uh, I actually have it in my records because I don't remember off the top of my head. I know he he was active um, between the Lindbergh uh, baby seven and seventy one. I have. Okay, so, so the 70s, uh, yeah. right? Yeah, he goes in and he would take the children and he didn't kill them, but he would assault them and he would literally go up a ladder. Well, it's a whole long, that's a whole elaborate story. That's like we could do an episode on it. But the thing about him was that's the infamous guy. You've probably seen photos of him where he made that very peculiar outfit to be very scary, where he had all the, the creepy Halloween masks that were sort of merged into one ugly mask. Right. And, Wear bracelets with nails and but things. he but and he didn't it was really to terrify the child. But he didn't he didn't abduct them out of the house. Yes, he did. He would he would take a ladder up to their bedroom window, take them down, bring them to a place where he had set up what was supposed to look like an altar, and tell them he was going to kill them there. And the idea was just to scare them. He was a guy that played Santa at Christmas time in the neighborhood. Did he, he bring them back? A and, a, and he would bring them home. Right. He didn't kill them. But that is one of the most bizarre cases. I, in fact, I'm writing about it for the new book. That's why it came to okay, mind. But, 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 but it's a really weird case, Chris. That's you know, the last here, right? The fact, guy's not leaving ladders up alongside, you know, Sebastian. Yeah, so. the Lindbergh, the Lindbergh um, abductor to put a ladder also, right? Right. That was in the 30s. But right. so, so let's, again, that's my point. Right. Uh, that yeah. If any, if anything, okay, they're, they're the ones that have occurred they've been arrested they've been captured now oh you, yeah now you take the two boys in bakersfield okay the boys in bakersfield yep cal city and, yeah. and you start overlaying what the parents were saying okay and do you see any similarities into what you're hearing here yeah okay are are there correlations to that okay? and but i think the i think the most telling piece of that one of them the most telling piece here of you know ld you know dlr does not look right or sound right is when mom says yeah i hear a thud okay and then you know six in the morning i go in there and he's not there and then she says well 
I don't know why he would walk out the door. You know, well, first of all, you weren't asked that. And second of all, you know, why are you volunteering that information when you supposedly should not know what happened? Because that's why you called the authorities. You called the authorities to help because you didn't know what happened to your child. And then all of a sudden, in a news interview, you know that he walked out that door, but you don't know why. That is a problem, America. And, you know, now, I guess people can spin it in any way, direction, form they want. Okay? But the other problem now that we have is secondary post incident behavior who's doing what what's the stepdad doing what's the biological mother doing what's the biological father doing what's the grandmother doing what's the grandfather doing are they hiring attorneys have they used the same attorneys in other incidences i.e divorces that kind of stuff okay and you start looking at that and then you start really digging into each of their backgrounds, i.e. what we call a suspectology. And then the, the authorities then need to step their game up. And they need to tell the public, in my opinion, and I said this about the hat in the Rachel Marin case, where they were holding back the, you know, the Nike hat where they got the, you know, the sum of the DNA off of that and and the drinking water bottle. I remember when you said that. I remember this. And next thing you know, it a couple of days later, they had a, you know, a podcast, and they said, "Oh well, you know, yeah, we have this Nike hat." Okay. Well, guess what? That guy was around for five months wearing a Nike hat. <laughs> they arrested him with a Nike hat on. Wouldn't that have been nice to know right up front? that they had a Nike hat and put it out into the environment. Okay. Instead, they put a sketch out, okay, but they didn't tell the any they didn't tell the public. And in this, so in this case, they need to tell the public, look, either the the biological father is eliminated and he's not a person of interest, because A, we have him on video at work, which he said he was from the last time I checked. The sheriff that he worked with allegedly said he, yep, he was here. Okay, then what's his motive to to kidnap his own child? Again, we go back to take the kid away from her because they're having a domestic argument or whatever custody problem. Well, great. Then he also has to get the kid's medicine. So check on those lanes. And if that medicine, again, has not been had for that child then the, the biological dad's a high probability he's not stashing the kid somewhere. Because okay? that would be foolish. You know, to take your kid and wait for three years till he hit 18 and the statute of limitations hasn't expired, and guess what? You're going to prison for filing a false you know, report and a kidnapping, quite frankly, at that point. So now you shift back and you say, okay, well, where was the child last seen? Oh, wait a minute, let me check. It was in his bedroom, and there was a thump heard. But somehow, mom knows that he walked out the door. And the dad's just going to parrot that information. You know, because if you see during the videos, he just keeps looking over at her like, yeah, 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 there you go. Yeah, that's the ticket. Yep, keep going, keep running. Okay. So... You know, that, that's not rocket science. So I would go talk to his first wife, his first wife, Sarah. Then I'd go to his second wife, Stephanie, and then Rachel. Then, of course, Nina. And you're, you're married to Katie. And uh, see what they all have to say. And I know Nina because I watched some of the stuff that came out a while ago on this thing. You know, she laid a whole bunch of stuff out there. Uh, but what about the other wives? This guy's had five wives. Why? Well, you know, sounds like he has relationship problems. 
And then I'd be curious what the wives say about the mother-in-law. That would really pique my interest as an investigator. What do they say about his mother? Because women know, especially wives, they know what the mother-in-laws, either they like them or they hate them. Yeah, very little middle ground there. Right. So I want to know if there's any smoke there as an investigator. And if there's smoke, there's fire. And you chase that fire until you get a behavioral workup of what both of these parties look like. And I do the same for Katie. Go back and interview anybody that's been in her life, ex-boyfriends. How is she around children? How is he around children? Have they ever been arrested? Have they ever been under suspicion by Department of you know, Social Services or Child you know, Protective Agencies? Are there any court orders that ever existed? And if so, what were those, what were the orders of the court? Because that means they went through a whole process to get to the court. How often was the court involved? So I hope the investigators, which I, I'm, I will put money on it, they're pulling all those reports and interviewing all those women. And Chris uh, Proudfoot has said publicly and admitted uh, that he at least one time had spanked Sebastian with a belt and that Sebastian went to school, told his teacher and a CPS report was generated from that. Now he says that they came out uh, and there was a, it was a big, you know, nothing burger in his, you know, to, to paraphrase or whatever he was doing. But uh, so we know of at least one incident uh, that he has admitted to. Um, well, then you look at his military record. Has he ever been court-martialed? If so, for what? And and where? I, I think he was at 32nd Street because I was in San Diego recently poking around. I know he was in Mississippi, and I know that he was uh, involved in recruiting with the Navy. Okay. And so, you know, I've heard some things, but, you know, we'll let him tell the world about it. Uh, and, but, and, you know, have there been court martials? I don't know. I, I've heard there could be, but we'll let him tell the world about it. And so then you've got to think through this and go, okay, that what's his volatility here? And does mom come running every time he gets volatile? I don't know yet. Yeah. I, what was their relationship like before Sebastian went missing? Were they living together? And if so, what was that like? Were there any domestic calls, you know, from the police, from the sheriff's department? Did the cops ever come to their houses and say, "Hey, you know"? Because remember, the police don't get involved if, you know, just to, they're not delivering cookies. So, Chris, as a, as an investigator, uh, as an investigator, say say the uh, the father, biological father, uh, Seth Rogers who was at work for a 12 hour shift. If you were leading this investigation, would you, would you clarify that alibi? Because Chris claims he has an alibi of uh, being in Memphis at work that he wasn't, that he wasn't there, uh, that he received a phone call, but they, they, you would think that that would probably be verifiable, right? I, I know that Seth Rogers was at work because Chris himself said that he couldn't get a hold of him because he didn't have a cell phone on him because he was at work. So he left, he, he texted him for when he was done with work, which was around seven. And uh, I think they called the police just a little, like it was a little after six. And it sounds like from, and I just double checked, Sounds like the cops got there around six thirty ish, and the the call was to the non emergency line a bit, just a little bit after six, uh, but between six about six ten or so, somewhere around. If there. 
it, it would take about 15 minutes to verify you send somebody over to the jail where the biological father was because my understanding he's a he's a jailer am i right yeah he, yes mm -hmm. okay so he's he worked for the sheriff's department mm -hmm. if he's in the jail and they have video of him in the jail it's a no-brainer you know because now then the second piece of this is okay then did he hire somebody to kidnap you know sebastian all right fine let's run that let's run that lane yeah let's run, let's run that lane so that's when you start looking for okay if if the father wants the child the biological father wants the child okay that means he has to also keep the medicine going in this child he has to feed this child he has to hide this child okay if in 24 hours okay, you could put a tap on that dad's phone okay it's called a pen link okay and you could you could get a search warrant to say look your honor you know this is a at-risk child we want to listen to this guy's phone uh, phone service i.e you know we want to hear what's going on here because there could be you know something that would lead us to the discovery of this child okay now that's one option the other option is just follow him put him under surveillance okay and follow him wherever he goes if the father in five months which i think that's where we're at we even within that within three months two months one month if that father never ever shows any indication of being around his son but every indication of looking for his son i don't know about you i'm not the sharpest tool in the shed okay? but that is not rocket science and you need to say okay guess what the biological dad's not involved let's take him off the list because we're wasting time mm. and go back and look at the house you know it, it's kind of like you know the other situation we've talked about this a million times okay with summer it, it just seems to be this you know re repeat of the summer wells case and guess what we're three years into the summer's wells case when that thing is in my opinion that case is solvable it's very solvable it it really is i mean you got don right now in utah committing crimes am i right josh yeah, you're a hundred percent right okay and i said he was committing crimes a long time ago and everybody said no no that's impossible and next thing you know it utah authorities are interviewing him for you know the 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 crimes he committed against his stepsisters correct the only the only problem there is the statute of limitations ran out yeah other than yeah. that i mean he was dead to rights he admitted it well and there's more coming there right? is absolutely right yep. okay well this is an god's giving us another opportunity to utilize that now think about that hopefully they're listening and this time they'll utilize it correctly it's the same thing here you're spinning your wheels if you've already eliminated by looking at the video of the dad walking through the hallways of the jail great you see it take a copy put it into evidence guess what he has an alibi time to move on sports fans yeah and the thing also chris when you say well did he have somebody else okay first of all You'd have to trust somebody enough to be able to pull that off. And either way, he's got to get inside whoever I'm saying he, whoever it is has to get inside that house, break into the house in the middle of the night, undetected, which is a felony, kidnap a child, which is another felony, a, a 15 year old child who, by the way, if a straight and uh, Dr. Gary, you'll know this better than anybody. I mean, if, if a child like, um, Sebastian, you know, who by his father's accounts has 
is anxious and, and, and is start, can be startled easily. Uh, a stranger shows up, takes him out of the house, undetected again, no noise, no nothing. Um, how do you I mean? How do you explain that one? How do you, how could you possibly um, explain them getting in and out of the house? So, like you said, is it is it possible? I I don't think so. I don't think it's possible or probable uh, for, for that scenario to happen. So you take you take him off the table, but you know what? You could also have an inappropriate, um, over trusting quality in people on the spectrum. For example, if you were to recognize the person that was coming in to take you, you might go with them because you're lacking the social judgment to find it odd that this person is asking you to go down a ladder in the middle of the night or whatever. But I would agree with you that all these suppositions are very improbable. Yes. I mean, from an Occam's razor point of view, right? All things being equal. I mean, the simplest explanation is usually the correct one. And I, I mean, don't we all sort of feel that everything just herds you toward the most likely and the most common supposition being that this was an internal dynamic and that there's an attempt, an unsophisticated attempt, potentially just a hypothesis, an unsophisticated attempt to come up with a cover story that from lack of experience and lack of research just kind of doesn't work. I mean, what do you think, Chris? I just think it's common sense. You know, investigative work is common sense. Right. And and when you have, again, 15-year-old boys just don't vanish, especially autistic boys. Five-year-old girls don't vanish from basements. Okay? And everybody knows, common sense would tell you, okay, then... How did this have, you know, what happened then? Is is common sense say that, yeah, this stranger comes into the house and somehow, again, masterfully, maybe it's the same guy that took Summer. Yeah, maybe. You know, because this guy's a master at taking kids out of houses and leaving absolutely nothing behind. Zero, zilch, nada. Okay. But what he has left behind is four parents that don't know what happened to their child because, you know, the last time they saw them, in Summer's case, she was in the basement or headed that way. But I saw her go to the house. Okay. And in this case, I heard a thump. Yeah, things were, you know, normal. I heard a thump. Yeah, he was in bed. I went, I woke up at six, but somehow the suspect was able to walk around the house here and get in, okay? And, man, I don't know how he walked, why he walked out that door. Well, if she if she thinks it's a stranger abduction, why is she putting it on Sebastian that he walked out the door, you know, on his own accord? Okay, so the person that would be alerted in the house would be the mother because she admits to being at home. So if somebody came into the house and if the dogs started to bark, that would alert the mother. That would be the fear is alerting the mother. But what if in the house, you don't have to be worried about alerting anybody because the person that is responsible for this is already in the house that may live in the house and that, they have a dog. They have a dog. Yeah. They have two little yapping dogs. Yeah. What kind of dogs are they? I think they're like, like kind of like wiener dogs. So they have two dogs. Yeah. They're the best witnesses in the world. I know. Aren't they? So do we know where the dogs were? That's yeah. troubling, Chris. Do, I mean, do we know where these dogs were that night? They were in the home. That is very troubling. You know, it reminds me of the dog that didn't bark in the night, you know, that kind of thing. Is that what you're getting at? Yeah. That, right. When when Paul Finks asked me in the Stephanie Crow murder, what's your feeling? And I said, the biggest, in, the biggest witness in this whole thing has never been interviewed, and that was a dog. Because I told him, if this guy's wearing a wool sweater, there's dog hair all over that. 
And guess what? There was nothing there. And he was found not guilty. Because that was the truth. And in this situation, if there are two dogs in the house and a stranger comes in yeah. and arbitrarily, you know, decides, well, I know these dogs or they're going to know me here in a minute and mom is in the house. Or if Sebastian's walking out of the house, those dogs are awake going, where are you going, dude? Yuppa, yuppa, yuppa. Or, you know, if they're not contained, but let me guess, they're in crates at night. Yeah, they're in crates, yeah. Of course they are. And they're they're uh, Morkies. Y- Yorkies? I would Morkies. Think- I don't know. I would think this a Yorkie is a mixture of a Maltese and a and a Yorkie, right? I believe so. so. They're yap- they're yappers. They're the biggest yappers. Man. Well, even in their crate, they're going to be yapping. No question. If there's a if there's somebody coming in in the middle of the night, the dogs are going to bark. I mean, it's just yeah. I have look. I have a dog that I have to crate sometimes, and he barks when you, you put him in the crate. It doesn't matter if you put a blanket over him or not. It's their nature. So, yes, they were kenneled up. Uh, they're Morkies. They bark. But what I'm saying, and once again, a stranger or somebody coming into the house in the middle of the night would disturb them. But, you know, if somebody was that lived inside of the house would not disturb them. And even if it did disturb them, it wouldn't matter because... You're the only one in the house that has to be alerted. If the dogs alert the mother, the only person that's in the house, then that's not a big deal for her. But if an outsider comes in and the dogs alert the mother, then you have yourself a big deal. And that's why when you say things like, I haven't left the house well, I don't think he did either. He's either ran off, somehow managed to el- elude the FBI, the military, the National Guard was out there looking for him, local law enforcement, volunteers, helicopters, drones. So he was e- he was able to elude all of that, okay? Or somebody has successfully taken him out of the house and is, is successfully hiding his location, whether he be dead or alive. Those are the two scenarios that I, I come back to. I, I just can't understand that there's, there's almost no chance that he would be able to avoid uh, being seen or detected or some sort of, the cops said they don't even, they don't know how he got out of the house. They have no, they, they just don't know. Well, well, look, I, I, they know they're not seeing. They, they might, they, yeah, they might know. Yeah. Well, look, I mean, anybody with common sense would, would, I mean, how could you not being an investigator? How could you not be suspicious of that story? And I'm not saying that they're a hundred percent guilty. I, you know, look, there are scenarios that I've never not thought of. I'm not a, I'm not a investigator by any stretch of the imagination, but you don't, You don't need to be a weatherman to know which way the wind blows. Thank you for listening to The Witness Box. I'm your host, Joshua Diaz, alongside my co-host, Chris McDonough of The Interview Room on YouTube, Dr. Gary Picado, author of The New Evil. You can pick it up on Amazon or any major bookstore near you. We'll be back next time with another one. Thank you for listening to The Witness Box.